Good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, Power for Bio uh, seminar on uh, equity uh, financial uh, instruments and on uh, how to finance uh, bio-based uh, food and feed uh, uh, companies and their value chains using the uh, European Structural Investment uh, Funds. My name is uh, Luigi Amati and uh, I am the uh, presenter for uh, uh, today's uh, session. Um, before I start with the presentation, I would like to give you a very short information about uh, our company, uh, Metagroup, who we are. Uh, we are a unique company in the sense that uh, we provide uh, innovation services uh, that uh, are uh, involving uh, from consulting to uh, managing authorities, uh, uh, national and international uh, uh, governments, uh, the European Commission, regions and cities around the world on innovation ecosystems, down to uh, coaching uh, and mentoring and training and building capacities uh, of uh, uh, startups and uh, research projects that are willing to transform uh, their uh, knowledge uh, into valuable uh, market services and products. Uh, and also, uh, we have uh, uh, an investment arm for which uh, uh, we are um, uh, working across Europe, uh, uh, investing in early stage uh, uh, startups. Meta Advisory, which is our consulting unit, has been performing over 700 projects on innovation and entrepreneurship across the world. Meta Academy has been training over 3,000 entrepreneur scientists uh, uh, with uh, different uh, training formats uh, on investment readiness, creativity camps, and the research uh, uh, to market uh, uh, type of training. And Meta Ventures has a unique expertise, as I was mentioning, in implementing, uh, designing, and managing public private financial instruments. Our mission is to make knowledge to market process more effective and uh, profitable. Um, about Meta Investment, which is, uh, let's say, the main part of the company, I am going to. Um, I'm going to use, if you like, to uh, to talk about uh, the financial instruments uh, today. Uh, we have been uh, managing early stage financial instruments for over 15 years. Uh, we have a portfolio currently of over 80 companies in different sectors, including uh, food and feed, as uh, we will see uh, later on. And uh, we have a, a unique ability to uh, develop customized uh, solutions for early stage uh, investments. The European Structural uh, and Investment Funds, I believe you are uh, all familiar with uh, this uh, terminology. Uh, the European Union, uh, through its uh, cohesion policy, which is one of the main pillars uh, of the uh, European Union policies uh, involving around one third of the total budget of uh, uh, the European Union, uh, is uh, um, the part of uh, the policies that um, tries to uh, reinforce cohesion among different regions and different countries, especially those regions which are lagging behind, but more in general uh, to reinforce the creation of job and building a socially uh, inclusive uh, uh, society. Uh, the two main goals are boosting growth and jobs uh, uh, for uh, a less developed transition and more developed regions and also to increase uh, European uh, uh, territorial cooperation uh, using uh, programs such as uh, Interreg. There are different types of structural investment funds which are dedicated uh, to the different uh, objectives. You have the European Agriculture Fund for Rural Development, the Cohesion Fund, the European Social Fund, the European Regional Development Fund, and the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. Overall, this formed the ESIF uh, program, which is uh, mainly delivered in the form of grants to recipients or through financial instruments, which are revolving instruments that can be found uh, in the form of loans, guarantees, and equity investments. The grant schemes are not financial instruments because they're not revolving. So they are given, uh, and uh, once they are given, they will not, uh, they will not uh, uh, come back. Whereas the financial instruments have the characteristics that uh, they might be given to the target beneficiary, but normally uh, the target beneficiary is expecting to return them through uh, repayment of uh, uh, loans plus interest, 
uh, ensuring that the guarantees is fulfilled or uh, by selling shares in the case of equity investments and through the sales of share, repaying the initial equity uh, investments. They are approved by the European Commission, they are implemented by the member states and by the regions, and the ultimate decision on how to use uh, structural funds uh, lies on the managing authorities in the different uh, uh, member states. Uh, if we look a little bit more into the detail of the financial instruments, as said, we have uh, uh, three uh, slash uh, uh, three plus one type of uh, uh, financial instruments, if you like. The first one, it's the loan. The loan being an agreement which is obliging the lender to make available money to the borrower for an agreed period of time and under which the borrower is obliged to repay that amount within agreed time, normally with an interest rate that varies uh, depending on the conditions of the economy, on the forms of uh, uh, the, uh, the company and uh, the, the type, the, the typology of, uh, uh, of the loan. The guarantee is that it's a written commitment uh, to assume the responsibility for all or part of a third party debt or obligation or for the successful performance by that third party of its obligation in an event which triggers such guarantees such as a loan default, that would be the most common. So the, the typical guarantee is given uh, uh, to a bank for uh, uh, the potential no repayment of uh, loans of uh, companies uh, to which the bank has actually uh, provided a loan. And finally, the equity, it's a completely different instrument because it is the provision of capital to a firm, but investing directly or indirectly in the return for a total or more often a partial ownership of that firm where the equity investor may assume some management control or in any case some level of control of the firm and may share the firm uh, profits. The financial returns are depending mostly on the growth and the profitability of the business and they are earned through dividends and or on the sale of the shares to another investor, so-called exit or uh, on the listing uh, of the companies uh, uh, on the stock exchange, also called initial public offering. Quasi-equity, finally, it's uh, a mixed uh, uh, type of uh, financial instrument uh, that ranks between equity and debt, has higher risk than senior debt, and has a lower risk than common equity. And quasi-equity investment can be structured as a debt, typically unsecured, and subordinated uh, to uh, loans or other type of uh, 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 other type of debts uh, that the company will have, and in some cases uh, it can also be structured as a convertible loan into equity or as a preferred equity, i.e., an equity having uh, uh, some uh, preferences with respect to the other shareholders uh, uh, and equity owner in the company. And the risk return profile typically falls between those of debt and equity in a company's capital structure, depending on the specific uh, uh, design of uh, quasi-equity. Um, what does a management authority need to know before starting? The first most important thing is that before allocating money to a financial instrument, the managing authorities have to assess what is needed, why, and by whom. The financial instruments are normally managed either by national or regional operating financial institutions that are selected with uh, uh, transparent uh, tender processes uh, uh, and, and, and that will run financial instruments on behalf of the managing authorities. For grants, an ex-assessment uh, of uh, the typology, size, uh, and the target beneficiary of the um, of the uh, instrument coming from uh, the structural funds is not uh, uh, required. But for financial instrument, there is a specific need uh, every time uh, uh, a managing authority is willing to implement one to uh, develop such a type of a study. They must uh, comply with the general provisions, which are the common provision regulations, uh, which are governing the overall implementation of the structural funds. Uh, these general provision, uh, these common provision regulations have been uh, last uh, time uh, ed um, provided in 2013. Since then, there has been some revisions. And now with the uh, future foreseen programming period of 2021-2027, 20, 
there will be some uh, amendments, some adjustments, some modification, but there will not be a completely new sets of uh, common provisions uh, uh, and regulations. So uh, the current existing ones will be carried forward also into the next uh, uh, programming period. When it comes to the ex-ante assessment, the required content of an ex-ante assessment, uh, it's uh, uh, based on seven areas. First, uh, there is the need to analyze the market failure. Second, there is the need to assess the value uh, added of the financial instrument, the consistency with other forms of public intervention, and if needed, state aid implications. There is a need to estimate the additional resources, either public or private, that have to be raised by the financial instruments and any preferential remuneration to third parties when this is needed. And finally, there is also a need for an identification of lessons learned from similar instruments uh, and ex-ante assessment that were carried out in the past. Proposed investment strategy is also needed, including an assessment of combination with grant support options for implementation arrangements, uh, and what are the financial products uh, which are forming the financial instrument, and uh, who are the target groups or the final beneficiaries. Uh, there is a need for specifying expected results uh, with indicators, both in terms of uh, return on investment, job creation, uh, development objectives, and so on and so forth. And finally, uh, the provisions for you know, the allowing the extent assessment to be uh, reviewed and updated in case things are uh, uh, not going according to uh, the forecast. The uh, European Commission has also uh, developed uh, a, a, um, a set of uh, so-called off-the-shelf uh, financial instruments uh, that are mainly uh, having the scope of providing uh, guidelines on how to uh, implement financial instruments. However, when we are using European Structural Investment Fund, the managing authorities uh, can implement uh, financial instruments uh, and uh, related financial products uh, in different forms, always after having performed an exempt assessment results. The three different options are, one, to use an already existing or a, new, or a newly created financial instruments, which are specifically designed to achieve the intended purpose and which respect the applicable uh, union and national rules. Therefore, you know, the managing authorities uh, will be able to make a so-called tailor-made instruments as uh, uh, probably the characteristics of their regions, the characteristics of the firms and so on and so forth do need such uh, uh, tailor-made. The financial instruments can also comply with the standard terms and conditions which are laid down by the commission uh, by the means of some implementing acts, which are subordinate, if you like, uh, legislative uh, tools with respect to the common provision regulation, so-called off-the-shelf financial instruments. And finally, managing authorities can also decide to use part of their uh, structural funds, uh, which are uh, managed at the regional level, so if you like, decentralized, um, and uh, put them to uh, inside EU-level instruments, which will be then ring-fenced for investments in the specific regions and policy areas uh, uh, covered by uh, the program, in which case uh, this will be referred as joint instruments uh, uh, for which uh, already existing uh, EU instrument level can be, uh, can be used. Uh, the off-the-shelf financial instrument, as I mentioned, uh, are uh, providing standard terms and conditions for a set of predefined financial instruments that can be set up and managed by managing authorities. By no means they are to be intended by, uh, as an obligation for managing authorities, but uh, rather as an opportunity or as a practice have shown in these first uh, years uh, of existence of uh, possibility of off the shelf, especially as guidelines uh, uh, to deliver uh, you know, faster and safer financial means. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the off-the-shelf financial instruments uh, have been, of course, designed, taking into account the experience of over 20 years of implementing structural funds by the European Commission and the Directorate General for Regional Policies and the region. So they contain a lot of uh, uh, knowledge and, uh, uh, and wisdom that has been uh, uh, coming out of the previous uh, uh, programming periods uh, in which financial instruments have been used. There are five off-the-shelf financial instruments. 
one uh, which is the risk sharing loan for SME based on portfolio risk sharing loan model. Another one called the cap guarantee, which is the form of guarantee for the SMEs. Another one is the co-investment facility, which is the equity investment fund for SMEs and startup companies based on a co-investment model, which we will also analyze more in detail during this presentation. Another one is the renovation loan for energy efficiency and renewable energy in the residential building sector. And finally, the urban development fund, which have also been used to assess, to finance uh, the implementation and uh, uh, the urban development project uh, in uh, uh, assisted uh, areas. Um, you can refer from the point of view of uh, uh, legal uh, uh, procedures uh, to the uh, Article 33.4 of the Common uh, Provision Regulation, uh, in which uh, um, there are uh, these uh, elements which I uh, briefly uh, mentioned you uh, explained uh, much more in uh, in detail so the first part is uh, uh, of the article 33.4 is how to invest in in capital uh, in uh, newly created or existing legal entities or to entrust the implementation uh, task to uh, uh, intermediaries such as the european investment bank uh, international financial institution or another body governed by public and private law which is selected uh, with the normal tendering uh, according to the EU uh, regulations. And finally, uh, you can undertake the implementation of the task directly, although the implementation of the task directly can only be implemented for loans and guarantees, while for equity financial instrument, as we will see, the managing authorities have to select, uh, in any case, a third party to implement equity financial instrument. Um, the way they are structured is obviously a way which do not require state aid notification and subsequent, uh, subsequent clear by the commission, they've been designed to be already uh, um, compliant uh, with uh, uh, these uh, legal uh, requirements. Um, another interesting opportunity, which is uh, uh, both for the off-the-shelf financial instrument, but uh, as I was saying, in general for financial instruments, even the tailor-made ones, is that they can also be combined with a grant that can cover some costs which could be uh, very relevant when implementing a financial instrument. For example, in the case of equity financial instrument, one uh, uh, quite expensive type of, of activity is to scout uh, the new projects and to assess the validity of this new project. So part of the scouting costs can be covered by grants uh, and they can be managed uh, either by the body that is implementing the financial instrument, but also to uh, another uh, entity. And even the managing authority is free to give direct support to an enterprise uh, in the form of grants uh, in order for them to be able to uh, take full advantage of the uh, financial uh, instruments. So to sum up, uh, um, from the uh, moment in which the money uh, is allocated at the EU level, it goes to the countries and regions that uh, will negotiate an agreement with the European Commission. Countries and regions will have to assess the finance gap of the uh, financial instruments doing a, an ex-ante uh, assessment, and then they will invest in activities uh, for loans, uh, uh, equi uh, equity and guarantees, uh, allocating their money to financial institution and hopefully develop uh, the investment strategy. If this is successful, then uh, you know these uh, funds will be able to repay the initial investment, and this will be uh, then possible uh, to be spent again to invest in uh, you know in enterprises and people, which will then grow and repay the funds and to be invested over and over again. From there, the name of uh, revolving uh, uh, instrument, uh, uh, which is given to the financial instrument, also to differentiate them with respect to uh, grants. So now, when we look at the two main forms of financial instruments, what do we have? We have equity, and then we have debt. As we have seen, the guarantee, it's uh, an underwriting of uh, a debt, so to a third uh, uh, party. So conceptually, it's uh, a support, if you like, to the uh, debt uh, uh, financial instruments. When we look, therefore, the two macro categories of equity and debt, um, uh, I believe it is important that we understand uh, 
what are their main uh, uh, targets. In terms of job creation, uh, equity is more focused on long term because we are investing money into a company which will need then to expand and to develop with high risk, but if successful, will be able to create a lot of new jobs. Versus the debt, we are normally investing in an existing company to provide uh, uh, perhaps uh, capital for uh, uh, working capital or running costs, or even to make some uh, innovation uh, of processes and, and products, but the investment will probably uh, go to grow this company organically. So, uh, you know, or, or to keep, if you like, this company uh, going. And uh, therefore, you know, the, the job creation will be lower and probably the impact will be more in the short term to maintain uh, uh, existing uh, uh, jobs. Uh, the second type of uh, uh, differentiation is also the quality versus the quantity. Um, so also, you know, the number of companies that we are investing in and the types of jobs. Normally, when we do have the same amount of money, if we dedicate this money to uh, equity, we are going to dedicate this money to a small number of companies, which will require quite a large amount of capital in equity, and uh, which will be uh, providing high risk and high return. And if successful, they will uh, uh, develop new, normally high quality uh, type of jobs. If you are providing the same amount of money for uh, uh, loans or for guarantees uh, in, in a debt scheme, uh, we will probably have uh, 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 an investment in uh, lower risk and uh, lower return type of companies, which will be providing uh, uh, in return probably, uh, as I said, the maintenance of existing job or even some new job, but probably the quality in terms of uh, level of skills will be lower than the one provided by the equity uh, financial instrument. It is very important to understand uh, this fundamental difference uh, and uh, um, while, uh, let's say, uh, everyone is familiar with uh, financial instruments uh, such as a loan or a guarantee because everyone will have bought its own house and probably had a mortgage and so understand uh, what it is a loan very well, not many people have been directly involved in uh, investing in companies and getting returns from this company either through dividends or through the sales of the share of this company. But it is important to understand uh, uh, these two fundamental differences because they will be impacting uh, substantially different type of companies and they will have a substantially different type of uh, uh, impact on the uh, economy of the regions where these instruments are, are being used. So in our presentation, as I mentioned, we will not focus uh, much on uh, uh, loans and guarantees, so on debt instrument, because they're more traditional and uh, uh, there is ample uh, literature. Uh, they are used, uh, as I said, mainly for uh, uh, covering uh, running costs, for purchasing uh, um, new equipment, uh, new materials, uh, and uh, this, type of, uh, uh, this type of investments. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, and, and to, if you like, maintain uh, the existing, uh, uh, you know, job base and uh, an infrastructure of, of the economy, which is uh, already there. We will uh, rather focus more on equity financial instruments because they are the ones that probably are uh, able to provide, uh, if you like, a stronger acceleration to the innovation ecosystem of the region, sometimes even to disrupt the innovation ecosystem to, uh, to the region, and also because they are a lot less treated in normal literature and they require a deeper understanding on uh, what is the real impact they can produce in order to be effectively implemented. Uh, as the level of risk they imply in each and every company is much higher and they tend to be uh, less used by managing authority that can be, so to say, uh, scared of using uh, a very large amount of money into uh, equity instruments which are investing in high risk company that could even uh, at least some of them fail uh, and not return any money in, uh, in the end. We will be giving you a, a rationale on why we need the uh, uh, innovative financial instruments. We will explain you why we need to have public private partnership when implementing this type of uh, instruments and which are the actors. And uh, uh, we will give you also an explanation on how the off the shelf 
financial instruments for equity has been designed by the uh, European uh, Commission. And finally, we will provide you with some case studies of regional equity funds, uh, the Ingenium funds that we've been managing through the years, and also uh, uh, with uh, some examples of companies we've been investing. And uh, uh, in the end, uh, we will conclude with some conclusions and, and takeaways. So let me start with uh, a more detailed definition of the uh, equity uh, instrument and quasi equity. And let me repeat that once more so that uh, uh, you know it can be 100% uh, uh, clear. When I'm investing in equity, I am making a direct capital contribution to a project. And I do not have any guarantee of repayment. So if the company is uh, going, uh, it's failing uh, and it's liquidated or even worse, if it's going bankrupt, there will be no repayment of this money. The return will come from uh, the performance or the project of the company over the investment period through uh, the sh sharing of dividends of this company or through the sale of the company uh, of which I own share and then for which I will have some uh, returns. And as I said, quasi equity can be a mix of uh, uh, equity and, uh, and debt. But it's important to notice that in equity financial instruments, in the worst case scenario, we could lose all the money. And this is what makes them quite scary if we do not understand exactly why are they so useful and why we should have them and what is the rationale and the logic they work with which is based on diversification of risk into a number of companies, into a portfolio of companies, out of which majority will fail. Otherwise, it would not be high risk, high return. Some of them will return a little bit of money, but the ones that will succeed, not only will return the money, but they will be the one that will be able probably to be a game changer in my region and in my uh, regional uh, economy. Why, uh, when we speak about uh, uh, food uh, and, and feed and agri, why do we think that, uh, uh, you know, at regional level, there is a need for knowledge intensive companies? Where, by definition, as I said, knowledge intensive companies, high risk, high growth. So, uh, where can you uh, develop this type of companies? Normally, you can develop this type of company. You can develop this type of companies even in markets which are not growing because you can disrupt the way you deliver services in a market which is quite stable. Think about renting apartments and think about Airbnb. But it's even more likely that this type of uh, high risk, high growth type of knowledge intensive company will be developed in markets that are also growing at a very high speed and uh, uh, a very high rate, because this is where entrepreneurs will look naturally for opportunities which are high risk and high growth. And if you look at uh, you know, the population growth forecast, we know that there is a, an increase in demand of food of 60, 70% by 2050. We know also that the population is aging and it's urbanizing. We know that uh, you know, the income uh, in general is growing. And we know that there is a very strong, extremely strong push for more renewable and more green economy. So definitely food and feed and agri is a main target for knowledge uh, intensive companies. And this is why having uh, financial instruments, especially equity financial instruments in our region is so uh, important. If you look at the growth of US uh, sustainable food market, you can see that it's uh, more or almost, uh, uh, let's say tripled in the last seven years. So incredible rate of growth integral type of opportunity, incredible type of companies that can be created uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, sector. Um, why do we need knowledge intensive companies? This is the most important thing to understand. If we do not understand the rationale for investing in high risk, high growth company, we will never develop equity based financial instruments, but we will also have a lot less chances to have real uh, strong innovation and a strong improvement of our uh, innovation ecosystem in, in our regions. And we will be, so to say, condemned to traditional uh, companies, which uh, with the speed uh, innovation is uh, uh, growing during these uh, years we are living, uh, it's uh, gonna be quite risky in terms of being outpaced uh, uh, and uh, outplaced by uh, the, the rate of growth of the, of the global uh, economy. 
So when we look at uh, uh, existing companies versus uh, new companies, one interesting graph to look at is this one, which was published uh, by the, um, the Census Bureau and interpreted by the Kaufman Foundation in the US. In blue, you will see the job creation in startups, and in red, you will see the net job creation in existing companies. And as you will see, with uh, the exception of very few years, like 1984, you know, in the in these 30 years of uh, uh, examination of these phenomena, the new jobs have been coming by new companies. And here we are referring to all companies. So a, a major already definition uh, and, and clarification has to be made whether, you know, when you're using structural policies that need to structurally change your economy, where do I put my money? Do I put my money in existing companies? Do I put my money in new companies? When it comes to job creation, uh, I believe that new companies are, uh, you know, quite interesting. Here you have another way to look at this, uh, uh, showing, uh, you know, how job creation in Europe uh, has been happening at the firm level analysis. Uh, you can clearly see that young SMEs, uh, young large firms and uh, uh, SMEs in general have been responsible for the creation of 80, 90% of jobs. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, the old large SMEs uh, the old large firms, sorry, and the old SMEs are responsible for most of the sharing job destruction. And, uh, destruction. and if you look and you compare these two, you will see again as the net job creator, it's mostly this uh, dark blue type of uh, uh, image which refer to the, young, uh, uh, to the young SMEs that create a lot of jobs and destroy a lot less job than they create. Um, the young SMEs are the, as I was saying, as the large net job creation contributors, and uh, the new member states are those that most could benefit from young job creation. So if we are also now focusing on a regional level on Central and Eastern Europe, that is even more rational for creation of new uh, young uh, uh, SMEs, especially, you know, particularly ambitious with high risks and high growth uh, profiles. Even more clear, I think, is the result of this study, which was uh, summarized in a study called the High Growth Firms and the Future of the American Economy, again carried out in the US by the Kaufman Foundation, which has concluded that top 1% of new companies created are creating 10% of all new jobs directly and 40% of all new jobs uh, indirectly. So meaning all the companies that are working around this uh, 1% super innovative new companies. And again, it confirms that new jobs are created by new uh, companies. So this is something that people don't capture uh, in, the, in the regular, uh, and if you like, and in the daily life uh, about, uh, you know, the fact that uh, startups and especially knowledge intensive startups, high risk, high growth, they are not only a nice thing to have. It's not just to say, ah, yes, I have a startup policy in my region. No, it's not that. They are a need to have. If you do not have a strong startup policy in your region, if you do not invest in high growth, high risk companies, you will not be able to create new high quality jobs and to change the innovation ecosystem in your, uh, uh, in your region. This is why we insist so strongly that especially equity financial instruments should be developed in each and every region to constantly increase the rate of uh, new high quality, high risk, high growth and high return type of uh, uh, companies. This is a conclusion from the OECD on high growth enterprises. And uh, um, it's clear that uh, as you can read, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and especially ambitious entrepreneurship uh, uh, it's uh, a key driver for uh, regional wealth. Now, if I have been uh, uh, hopefully not convincing you, but uh, attracting your attention on the fact that knowledge intensive companies are very important, uh, let's have a look at what it is needed for uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, knowledge intensive companies to happen and to be continuously generated in the market. And now it will take you a little bit broader than just financial instruments, and you will allow me for a second to touch also 
uh, two more points, which I believe, again, are very important to capture the essence of why do we need equity uh, financial instruments. Uh, if we don't uh, go uh, and uh, if you don't capture this part, I'm afraid that, uh, you know, it will not be uh, easy then uh, for you to understand the reasoning behind equity financial instrument and even more, you know, to be able to convince your policymaker, your stakeholders that, yes, it's OK to have some guarantees and some loans that bank will normally provide that. But yes, it's even more important to have risky uh, type of financial instruments, uh, such as equity financial instrument, because they will not only provide returns, but they will especially be able to impact uh, uh, and change your uh, uh, your local economy. So knowledge intensive companies are made of three components. The first is ambitious entrepreneurs. The second is intangible assets. And the third is finance for growth. Of course, our main topic today is finance for growth and equity financial instrument. But let me dig a little bit deeper into the first two elements of ambitious entrepreneurs and intangible assets, because I think that uh, it is important also for you to have a little bit of a bigger picture to understand that it's not just about financial instrument, but that there is a need also to have some uh, parallel uh, uh, actions and parallel activities and to understand a couple more things in order to make uh, these equity financial instruments work really well. So let's talk about entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurship and mindset. This is, if you like, the typical uh, uh, prototype of the uh, European graduate. And as we know, we have many European graduates. And as we know, the level and the quality of our education is extremely strong. And all the graduates, they like to talk about uh, uh, innovation, market, liberal economy, entrepreneurship, and so on. But when the time comes to move towards the marketplace themselves, they say, but why should I? Why should I be the one that goes to the market? So there is a, a little bit of a difference before be, between what you know people say in general and people and what people do. It's true that in these challenging times, uh, there is a little bit more of a tendency towards entrepreneurship, but that is more, if you like, entrepreneurship for need. What we are talking about is entrepreneurship for the ambition of really building a new service, a new product uh, to change the structure and the typology of our economy in, uh, in our region at national and international level. Look at what uh, mindset can mean. This is a survey that is uh, carried out uh, by an association on global attitudes, which uh, has made a statement, your future does not depend on you. And then has asked people whether they agreed or whether they disagreed. And you can immediately see like in countries like, such as the US, over uh, 60 and almost 70% of people would agree that the future depends on me and uh, uh, you know would, uh, would disagree that uh, the future is uh, instead depending on, on someone else. Whereas if you go to countries which do have a different uh, culture, um, and if you take the stream in this case of India, uh, it's uh, you know clearly the other way around in which 80% of the population will say that the future is not depending on me. It can depend from, uh, I don't know, the weather conditions, uh, some religious belief, uh, the uh, environment I'm living in and so on and so forth, but that doesn't depend on me. And if we, you know, and this uh, change in mindset is extremely important to go along with, uh, you know, financial instruments. Otherwise, financial instruments by themselves will not be able to produce uh, uh, to produce any results. Uh, the results of uh, having a, a much more proactive and entrepreneurial culture can be seen uh, if you look in the recent year in these slides, for instance. This is where the largest young research and development knowledge intensive companies uh, here by size, let's say, but that's not so relevant, are in uh, uh, each and every region. So if you look at, uh, you know, the smaller size, basically they're only in the US. But even if you look at the big R&D firms, this is mostly only US and China. And you can see that Europe is there, but definitely, you know, it's not a leading player in terms of uh, new uh, knowledge, innovative uh, uh, type of uh, type of companies. And what it's even more striking is if you look at this slide, which is the one that I could find that would go the most back in time, in which you can see uh, the 500 largest companies today, 
which uh, uh, were uh, which you know have been created uh, some of them already centuries ago where they have been created and you can see that um, Europe can trace back even before 1775 the ownership, the initial ownership of some companies that today are among the top uh, uh, 500 uh, companies uh, in the global uh, financial times, uh, uh, global 500 listed companies. But if you can see in the in already while Europe was the only player in the up until the 18th century, in the 19th century, uh, the United States started to emerge. And definitely in the 20th century, Europe started to decline and the emerging countries started to, to grow. And if you look at the last 25 years, and I'm sure when the statistics will be released now for the 2001, 2025, this probably will be even stronger. You will see that the United States and emerging countries are where you know global companies are born, and Europe is uh, uh, has lost its uh, entrepreneurial ambition, its entrepreneurial drive. So we may not see this, uh, if you like, in the short term, or you know, if you look at one day after the other, you don't see this. But you have to understand that these are trends. And if you're not able to change the entrepreneurial mindset, and when I'm talking about the structural funds, for instance, you know that there is the European social funds, which are dedicated to training and building capacity. There are a lot of uh, activities that can be done in that respect. These activities have to go in parallel with uh, the development of uh, dedicated financial instruments for ambitious companies and entrepreneurs. The second point that I wanted to touch, as I mentioned to you, is uh, the intangible assets. Uh, the knowledge intensive companies are made by some things which cannot be touched and this is terrible especially you know for traditional uh, financial instruments like loans and guarantees loans and guarantees are completely attached to the collaterals that you can provide the job of the bank even if uh, you know, you go with uh, uh, the house that you want to buy. You everybody knows that the mortgage is released only when uh, you you will be able to have a you know uh, as a guarantee the house, which has a value which is at least maybe 1.5 or even two times higher than the mortgage that you are requesting. But there there has to be a collateral. And the same goes or used to go for companies because companies could guarantee with their plans with their land, with their uh, capital, and so on and so forth. But nowadays, the economy is going so quickly uh, towards a transition, which is now almost being completed uh, from tangible asset to intangible asset, that there is not the possibility to guarantee the most innovative, uh, high risk, high growth and promising type of companies, which have only as uh, uh, assets their ideas, their designs, their trademarks, their patents, but definitely not anything tangible. Look at this slide, which to me is the most impressive in this uh, uh, respect. This is, if you look, the, take the standard and poor first 500 companies by market capitalization in the world. In 1975, out of 100% uh, of value, 83% of the value was made out of tangible assets. So again, land, capital, plants, you know, something tangible that could be touched and that was in the balance sheet as tangible. And only 17% was intangible. Look what happened in the last 40 years. This pyramid has gone upside down and even more. It's only 13% of the value of these companies today the Google of today, the Amazons of today, the um, Facebooks of today, or the biotechs of today, and so on and so forth, they are made of intangible. 87% of the total market capitalization, it's actually based on intangibles. So how are you going to use loans and guarantees to invest in this type of companies? Not possible. You need equity financial instruments. And if we are not able to, to go fast on this, we will be even more losing ground. We have already lost the battle of biotech, the battle of ICT. We are losing, as we know, the battle of artificial intelligence, although some people think that Europe can still uh, you know, come back. But if you look then you know, further right to the future, into new batteries, gene therapy, quantum computing, and so on and so forth, Europe still 
you know, has a chance to be a player in this type of uh, areas, but needs to go fast and needs to move and understand that you need to take risks, you need to invest in intangible if you really want them to be a, a, a player in today's global, global economy. So when I've done these two points and hopefully when now, you know, in these 10 minutes, I made you at least maybe not convince you, but at least made you curious about these knowledge intensive companies. And there are three components. So the entrepreneurial mindset and the, in, the capability of understanding and investing in tangible assets. I think it is clear that if you want to transform knowledge intensive ideas, and if you want to have companies startups which will scale up and that tomorrow will be able to have an impact in your region change the economy of your region you need equity finance otherwise they will never move into new knowledge intensive companies they will never be at the far front uh, of the uh, innovation uh, and uh, uh, you know new uh, economies that we are all looking for like the bio-based economy where are we now this is where are we now in investing in uh, you know this type of companies look at how much venture capital is invested in uh, the uh, eu and how much capital is invested in the united states and you can immediately see what kind of striking difference you have in this uh, uh, in these two uh, uh, part of uh, parts of the world the europe is able to invest uh, around or to raise if you like as in this slide to raise around 6 billion euros every year of venture capital. The US is able to invest six times more. And this is like, uh, you know, the gasoline in your car. If you invest six times more, you will go six times uh, uh, further uh, than, uh, than, than us. So, you know, we, the, we need more financial instruments. We need more investments. We need more equity in this type of uh, uh, economy. And we need more uh, uh, knowledge intensive companies in order to have more in knowledge intensive companies. Why are we talking about using the structural funds? Why do we need public money? Well, we need public money because the chances uh, for uh, you know accessing startup uh, for a startup to access uh, uh, finance, traditional finance, as we were saying in uh, um, traditional financial organizations such as banks, is very limited. It is quite a, a high uh, risk that banks have to take. They're not uh, prepared, they're not equipped, it's not their job. Banks are banks. They normally you know, are dealing with debt uh, finance. So um, you, know, you need uh, to uh, introduce equity finance. You need the public sector to stimulate this. And as we will see, when it's at the very, very early stage level of uh, you know, a new idea, a new service, a new product that maybe it's going to disrupt the market in the future, the risk is so high that there will always be the need of public finance when we transition from, let's say, a research uh, to market. The closer we will go to the market, the more private investor we will uh, be able to attract, but we need public finance in order to attract private investors. And who are these private investors at the very, very, very early stage when you know we are really investing in uh, in startups uh, and uh, in uh, in uh, companies which only maybe have a, a proof of concept or a prototype of their service or their product normally the majority of these private investors are the so-called business angels and i'm well aware that in certain parts in europe uh, um, you know angel investors are not so well uh, uh, developed but more and more you know these ex-managers successful entrepreneurs people that do have some time and some money are willing to go along public finance to provide their private money and to be able to co-invest with the equity financial instruments we can create using the structural funds and make sure that as they have invested their own time and their own money, the investments overall, it's well controlled and it's uh, kept in good shape and going in the, in the right direction. So uh, being able to couple uh, public investment and private investment, it's very important. And this is why we speak and in the off the shelf. So in the guidelines, the commission gave about equity financial instruments, they talk about the co-investment fund. The public investor is keen uh, you know, to support less developed regions and to create new jobs, but the profit 
is not a priority, whereas the private investors are profit driven. So you have to, you know, you have to find the combination and uh, through uh, the uh, possibility of taking away some of the risk with uh, public funding, uh, you can be able to attract some uh, uh, private money. You need to build a good, sound private partnership to fulfill the expectation of uh, both of the parties uh, engaged. There is a third player, uh, apart from public investor and private investor, which is fundamental to be engaged in this process. You need a fund manager. So as I was saying before, while the guarantees and the loans can be uh, directly managed by the managing authorities, the common provision regulations provide that equity financial instrument needs to be outsourced. Why do they need to be outsourced? Because you need, for the logic of the equity financial instrument themselves, that you need to take risk in order to succeed. This is not such a good logic when it is uh, implemented in-house with uh, uh, people that are employed by the public sector and that uh, uh, are not so prone to uh, taking such a high amount of risk without having the reward, but only having the downside of uh, being blamed if uh, some of the companies fail. The, the economics of an equity financial instrument is such, as I said, that a lot of companies will fail, some will succeed, and those that will succeed will return the money and even more the money. And therefore, you can uh, reward a good private uh, commercially driven fund manager with not only you know paying him every year for uh, doing uh, the, the management of the funds, but especially with the final success fee, which in uh, uh, the jargon of venture capital and equity financial instrument, it's called carried interest, for which the uh, fund manager, if it's good, can get up to 20 or 30% the capital gains at the end of the life of the fund, if the fund has been really successful. So you need to have a third player being a, an independent, commercially driven fund manager to manage these uh, financial instruments in order for them to really address the right targets, i.e. the high risk, high growth uh, companies. So to sum up on this first part, knowledge intensive startups are crucial for the region. They account for 100% of new jobs. Their value is based on intangible and on future cash flow. They need money, but they're not attractive for banks, not for traditional venture capital, which will be investing in later stage company, which already have a revenue, a certain structure, and so on and so forth. They need equity. There is a market gap. You need public finance to attract uh, also private investors. This is why the European Structural Investment Fund co-investment facilities are a viable option. Let's have a look at what it looks like, these co-investment financial instruments. And I will not go into the details in, of each and every um, line of how this should be designed. Um, we know that uh, you, you need to do the ex-ante assessment, but let me just focus on this uh, slide. And again, if I can raise your curiosity and convey a little bit of the sense why it's so important to develop equity financial instruments, I will have achieved my goal. So let me uh, have you um, take you through this uh, through this uh, slide. How does it work? To the top right, you have the program contribution. The program contribution is the money that uh, a managing authority will have allocated to an equity financial instrument after an exempt assessment that have shown that in your region there is a need to introduce innovation, to introduce uh, knowledge intensive companies, to introduce startups to change the innovation ecosystem of your region. So a certain amount of money will be dedicated to that. Once that is done, the managing authority will issue an open call for selection and will select, as, as we said, an independent commercially driven financial intermediary, with which will have to have also certain participation of its own money into the facility to align interest with the investment. The financial intermediary will also commit to be able to raise some other private money than his own in order to couple that private money with the public money which is provided by the co-investment facility which you see to the top uh, uh, to the top right below the program contribution typically on the top left uh, the private co-investors who are they they are companies they can be business angels they can be venture capital funds and then you have the target firms and depending on the stage of development of the firm, whether it's a seed stage, at startup stage, or at growth stage, 
the financial intermediary is required to secure a growing amount of private money. So the private money will have to be 10% if the company is at seed stage. So as we said, if the risk is very high, it's pre-commercial, you only have a proof of concept, and uh, you, know, you will not be able to have 100% of private money taking that level of risk. The level of private money will go down to 40, will go up to 40% if the company you will be investing is a startup. So it's uh, either at first commercial revenue or pre-commercial revenue, but already with the market test, and therefore the level of risk is lower. And the level of private money will go even higher at 60% if you will be investing in a growth company, which has already a turnover, which maybe has already been successfully sold products in its own territory, and it's going to scale up uh, at national and at international level. So this is how the facility will work. And of course, you can immediately see that this facility can be applied to any sector. This is sector agnostic. So if in the region there will be a clear identification of investing in bioeconomy, then you can have an equity financial instrument that can be fully dedicated on uh, bioeconomy. If bioeconomy is only one of the sectors, you can have an equity financial instrument which is sector agnostic, but which include bioeconomy as one of the possible sectors in which you will be able to invest. As I said, I'm not going to go into the details. You will find my slides will be available uh, after this presentation, how to set up uh, a proper uh, financial instrument uh, in terms of uh, uh, what the off the shelf is saying. Let me repeat only once more that uh, you do not have to use the implementing ads at all costs. Actually, I don't think that many regions have been using it, but a lot of regions have been using the off the shelf, uh, uh, not uh, through the uh, detailed uh, implementation using the implementing acts but more as a guideline. So understanding the overall concept and then making a co-investment fund that we're suiting uh, their needs at, uh, at best. So here there are quite a lot of the things that I told you explained more in detail. Um, let me go uh, quickly through the different instruments for different regions. Here, another concept I would like to pass on to you is a, a picture in this slide. This is some of the regions in which as Meta we have uh, uh, experience of managing uh, uh, early stage equity financial instruments. And just to give you, you know, a very uh, quick and, uh, and dirty uh, number, which will make you understand why you cannot do uh, the same type of financial instruments in every region. If you look at the Emilia Romagna region, the number of EU patents per million inhabitants every year is 118. And if you take in the same country, Sardinia as a region, you will see that the same statistics uh, goes to 7.16 every year. So clearly Sardinia and Emilia Romagna cannot have the same type of equity financial instrument. Potentially in uh, Sardinia, you will have to have a more gradual approach towards uh, introducing uh, a change and uh, uh, an incremental uh, increase of uh, innovation uh, into the innovation ecosystem. So investing in an innovative SME uh, in Sardinia will not necessarily mean exactly the same as investing uh, in Emilia Romagna, whereas uh, in Emilia Romagna probably you have already a system with companies which are at the state of the art like Ferrari or Ducati or you know all the companies in the packaging industry, the oldest university in the world being the University of Bologna, you can really invest uh, probably in knowledge intensive companies that can have a global impact in terms of uh, you know the knowledge and the know-how they generate. So you have to be careful and you have to weight the level of uh, innovation and the level of uh, uh, disruption that you want to bring with the equity financial instrument, depending on the starting uh, uh, level of your, uh, uh, of your region. So here it's a bit more detail about all these uh, funds, but I am aware of time we're running out. So uh, yeah, this is Ingenium Sardinia, this is Ingenium Emilia Romagna. Here you have more details how they've been structured. The only thing I would like to say here is that these were funds that were made at the very beginning. The one in Sardinia had already a certain size of 34 million euro. The one in Emilia Romagna was quite small of 14 million euro. One thing I would say, don't make it too small. I don't have the time to enter into the details, but uh, an equity fund should not be lower than 20, 30 million to allow risk diversification, so to be able to invest in a certain number of companies over a period which typically is of five years, 
and also to allow for having a management fee, which is normally a percentage of the size of the fund, which allows to have a, a management team which is professional, capable, and stable. So less than 30 million euro, it should not be the case for an equity financial instrument. If your region is small, don't worry. I mean, you can always partner with the neighboring region and make, uh, together with uh, uh, the, this other region, an equity financial instrument of the, of the, right, uh, uh, of the right size. Uh, let me quickly go through some of the companies we've been investing in uh, recently. For instance, this is with one fund in Umbria of Joy, uh, 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 an innovative startup which uh, is manufacturing and, and selling uh, soy meats. Uh, Taste Italy, it's a company based in Modena, which uh, it's uh, uh, manufacturing uh, fresh pasta, but totally gluten-free. And uh, Pizzetta Pharma, it's a pharmaceutical, which is... Uh, developing uh, uh, qualified products uh, uh, for uh, uh, you know um, the nutraceutical area with uh, you know therapeutic solutions which are used for uh, doctors and aimed at people health and, and well-being as i said this market is really growing and it's exploding so you know there will be a lot of opportunities to invest in uh, uh, knowledge intensive companies and to develop equity financial instruments before i conclude i would really like to go through uh, a few recommendations and I would like you to have these main takeaways. The first lessons, which I hope uh, I've been able to uh, give you at least, uh, at least, as I said, steer uh, some curiosity. Equity is the suitable financial instruments for knowledge intensive companies, which are the engine for prosperity and job creation. If you want your regional innovation ecosystem to be thriving, to be a change maker in your region, you have to have knowledge intensive companies and to have knowledge intensive companies you need to have equity financial instruments you need to have equity investments the co-investment equity facility is a suitable instrument to invest in this company a deal by deal approach is a good one because not every region will be so big in a specific sector of the economy to have a dedicated instrument so most regions do have this equity financial instrument of sector agnostic and one sector of course in this case could be bioeconomy Co-investment facility can include grants. Don't forget that certain activities are very expensive and it would be good to put in parallel to uh, the funds that can be invested in equity into companies, some money, as I said, to build a, a stronger entrepreneurial mindset, to pay for scouting costs, uh, to prepare uh, entrepreneurs with investment readiness uh, uh, seminars and so on and so forth. And having a commercially driven fund manager is necessary. If this money is managed and managed which are non-commercially driven, they will never be willing to take the risk of investing in companies that most likely will fail. Normal portfolio in a fund, it's like 20 companies and 10 of them will fail, will either liquidating or bankrupt, say six or seven will more or less survive and return some money and only two or three will succeed. There is no possibility to do a, such type of uh, profile of portfolio and risk profile if you're not uh, with a commercially uh, driven fund manager. The size of the fund has to be at least 15, 20 million, but recommended is at least 30 to 50 million. And the co-investment instruments are very, very, very useful to start attracting private investors. If you can say in your region, I have a 30 million euro fund, now, you know, people will listen and, uh, you know, angels, family offices, private investors, uh, uh, companies, uh, you know, no matter what you have in your region, if you say to them, okay, I have this very high risk, high return opportunity, I'm going to put 90% of the money, would you like to try you know, with 10% and you help me to grow this company? People will be listening to, to this type of uh, messages. We have been also on tender and reporting, going through you know, a lot of tenders. And I have to say that uh, you know, the European Investment Fund has done a great job in trying to develop a culture for uh, you know, proper, transparent, uh, uh, well-structured uh, uh, tenders and procedures. And I encourage you to look into what the EIF is doing, even if you want to tender on your own and you don't want to rely on the EIF, but still see what they do. For example, now there is a, a co-investment uh, uh, fund uh, measure in, uh, in Greece. And if you type uh, business angel co-investment fund Greece, you will see what I mean, in which you know you have all the all the details of the terms of reference, how it should be structured, what is the size, uh, what is the target companies, and so on and so forth. 
So make tenders which are open, transparent, and non-discriminatory because you know it's very, 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 very important to attract the best fund manager to reward them uh, appropriately and to make sure that uh, you know this equity financial instrument works well. Um, assignment in house it's uh, it's quite uh, uh, it's quite tricky and uh, doesn't work very well. Finally, um, be aware that uh, at European level a few years ago has been introduced a, a directive called the Alternative Investment Fund Manager Directive, which is now more and more becoming the standard for fund management companies managing equity uh, financial instruments. And more and more authorities are requiring that the bidders are already uh, alternative investment fund managers authorized by the financial authorities or will uh, uh, oblige themselves to become an alternative investment fund manager if they will win the tender. So please take into account also this uh, uh, piece of regulation when uh, uh, preparing your tender. With this, I would like uh, to uh, just give you a final uh, um, slide on where you can find the most relevant regulation. Regulations are constantly updating. As I said, uh, you know, here are the most important. The general block exemption regulations are the one talking about the 10%, uh, 40%, and 60% uh, uh, amount of private investment in companies in the seed, startup, and growth stage. Uh, the common provision regulations are giving you uh, the fundamental uh, rules of the European Structural Investment Fund. In the general block exemption regulation, you will also find the general rule to make a venture capital fund or an equity financial instrument, as it is called, uh, uh, using the as if jargon uh, state aid free which if you don't want to deal with uh, you know, seed startup growth, you just want to make one venture capital fund, then you need to design it in a way that at least 30% of private money is attracted, no matter if at the level of the fund or if at the level of each and every deal. And finally, here you find the delegated and implementing acts describing uh, the uh, off-the-shelf instrument. Once more, that's not for you to uh, say that you have to use uh, these acts uh, uh, and this is the only way in which you can implement good financial instruments. You can do your own, you can do it tailor-made, but please have a look at them and read uh, these acts because they, they represent very good guidelines to uh, develop the, a good equity financial instruments. And I wish you to be successful in the development of an equity financial instrument in your uh, region. And I wish that that will power uh, the bioeconomy uh, regional development, which we all need so much. Thank you very much.